In the previous video we saw how we can actually train our multi-label classifier, but we never actually validated the model to make sure we don't overfit. In this video we're going to add a validation to our training loop to make sure the model does not overfit. Stay with me. Hello everyone and welcome to ML Don. Let's see how we can add the validation set into our training loop to make sure we don't overfit. Now, the code will basically remain almost exactly the same as the previous video. We just have to make a couple of sort of small adjustments to make sure that uh, the validation is also considered in the training loop. One thing that uh, I'm just gonna uh, change here just to illustrate how uh, during the training process you could end up in a scenario where training error, the training error keeps going down, but the validation error all, all of a sudden would go down, but it would plateau and then it would start going up gradually. So first things first, previously I had set the number of epochs to 10, just to show you the gradual decrease in the training error. But now because we have a validation set and we're going to utilize it, we're going to increase the number of epochs to make sure we will have trained our model for as long as we possibly could before we risk overfitting. So I'm just going to increase this to 50 epochs. Next, I'm going to add a separate list here, which will keep track of the validation loss the same way that we were doing for the training loss. Um, and the second thing is, we're, I'm not going to um, have the mode set to train for my uh, data, data, uh, data set class, simply because in my loop here, in my uh, you know, loop through epochs here, because I'm gonna have to train and validate, train and validate, so it means that I'm gonna have to keep switching between the train mode and validation mode for my data set object. I don't need to set it here uh, over, um, set it out here. I'm going to be train, uh, sort of setting the mode and alternate between train and validation in the for loop. So no need to set it outside. Where we will put it, however, is gonna be right here where we say that, okay, first foremost, in this current epoch, I just want to train the model. So I'm gonna set the model to train as well. And then the training starts here. We backpropagate, we optimize and so on and so forth. The main thing for validation that we're gonna be uh, needing is right after this line. Now, this is the magic. This is where the magic happens. I'm gonna uh, create a list very similar to train losses that will keep track of the validation loss for every data point in the validation set. Remember, we're not gonna be using the, the training data here. So I'm just gonna add a space. I'm just uh, gonna call it val underscore losses. And as you can imagine, because at this point we will have trained for, uh, th using the entire training data, why training? Because we have set the mode to train at this point. We're going to have to switch back the mode to validation before we can actually use the validation data or validation set in our data set object. So I'm just going to say, let's make sure that my data uh, will be, my data set object will be in validation mode. The second most important thing that we need to do is to make sure that the model is not in train mode, but in eval mode. This is absolutely crucial. Now, there's a common misunderstanding about model eval. People think that when you say model eval, it, it, it's basically uh, telling PyTorch that I do not want you to calculate the gradients with respect to the parameters of my model. I just, just wanna make sure that this is clear. Model eval has nothing to do with gradient calculation of your model. What it does is, it basically does two important, most important things. Number one, it shuts down dropout. Because during training, there are you know, neural networks where you actually have the dropout layer where it just randomly turns off and on certain random neurons at different layers. Um, so it turns off dropout because during testing, you do not need dropout. You just wanna use all the neurons at their current activity and uh, excitability that you've learned. Number two, it makes sure that the batch norm layers will behave um, in test mode or in eval mode, which means that during training, the batch norm layers, I, I don't want to get into the details of this, but as a broad view, during training, the batch norm layers are there to make sure 
that the activations of each layer will, will behave themselves, basically. So um, the batch from layer would keep track of the mean and uh, the variance of the activations of, the, um, of each layer of neurons with respect to the current mini batch of the training data. But when you say model.eval, it means that, look, I do not want the batch norm layers to keep track of the mean and variance of the uh, validation or the test data that, that I'm using right now, because I'm not going to train uh, the, the model now to learn the, uh, the, variance, and, uh, the variance and the mean uh, with respect to the test data. That's not what, what I want to do. What I want is, uh, I want the batch norm layers to use the mean and variance that they've learned across the entire training data that they've seen before, keep them fixed, and use those statistics while I'm evaluating the model or testing the model, okay? So these are the two operations that model eval does. It does not have anything to do with whether uh, we're going to calculate the gradients or not. So be uh, wary of this, this is very important. Okay, next. Um, speaking of gradients, now I want to say that, okay, because I'm evaluating the model now, there is no need for the computational graph to actually calculate the gradients or keep track of the gradients, okay? Because of that, I, I can actually, in, in a very simple line, tell PyTorch, do not calculate the gradients for what follows, okay? And that line is with torch that no grad and then you indent so whatever happens in this indented block is considered not requiring any grad gradient calculation now here remember because i've set the the data set objects mode to val Again, I'm going to create a loop to go through, uh, to go through the, the data set object, but because I have set the mode to val, remember that my data loader will only grab the, uh, the get item will only grab the validation data and the corresponding ground truth because the mode is, uh, is set to val now. Here, again, uh, nothing new. I'm just going to literally copy and paste what I have here. There, there's nothing new here. It's exactly the same process. So I'm grabbing the data. I'm grabbing the label. I calculate the output of the model. I calculate the error and then um, basically sum the error and that's it. I will add this loss to my val losses list. that append, and then again loss, because it's a one scalar tensor, I just need to use the item method to actually have access to the, to the actual scalar value inside the tensor. And finally, I will just add the average of val losses to my epoch val loss that I have uh, defined, I believe here, yes. So that would be the sort of average of all val losses for the current epoch. That is it, right? So just to review what's happening here, at the current epoch, you go, th you go through the entire training data, you do training, and then you keep track of your losses. And before going to the next epoch, you make sure that you will also validate with the current model that you're fixing here uh, without calculating any gradients. You go through the validation set and again, keep track of the losses of the model up to this checkpoint that you've trained so far, yeah? Finally, in terms of printing out stuff, basically I'm just gonna re replace this with this line where now we are also keeping track of the val loss up to six decimal points. And again, I'm here adding the mean of val losses. Let's see uh, whether we will see that sweet spot where the training loss keeps going down and the validation so loss all of a sudden would plateau and then start uh, would start gradually go higher. I'm just gonna run this cell. Now this one will take some time, mind you. Let me speed things up. Okay, great, now we are done. It took a long time, so I had to speed up the video, the recording. 
But you can see that, um, first of all, the training loss for every epoch, you can see that it's uh, the, the general trend is that's actually going down. And then the validation error, it starts somewhere from 20, like 0.21, uh, goes down and to 15 and then you, you, you see that it, it's beginning to increase 16 17 19 again 18 now in terms of um, Visualizing the validation loss as well. So this is the same code that we used before for visualizing the training loss All I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna add uh, the plt.plot epoch val loss the label is gonna be validation loss now if I actually run this <coughs> This is not bad. This almost shows what's happening here. So if you notice, the very beginning, um, we are both uh, we are observing some drop in both the training loss and validation loss, and up right up to this point over here, which would be probably somewhere around uh, epoch four, three or four, it looks like a plateau is happening here in the. In the trend of validation loss and after some time somewhere around the fifth epoch we see that there's a gradual increase in the validation loss and you see that the general trend is that the the validation loss is slowly but surely going higher and higher while the training loss is still going down and down and here you notice that it's almost plateauing to a particular very near zero value let's say so if you were to actually pick the optimal epoch here you would go somewhere around here, like around the fifth epoch, where you can see that visibly the validation loss is beginning to go higher. So if you keep your training uh, to five epoch, the duration of five epoch, you have a very low chance of overfitting. Now you know how to use a validation set to determine, uh, to determine the optimal number of epochs that you need to train your multilabel classifier for. In the next video, we will see how we can actually test this model and even evaluate it properly. If you like this video, please make sure that you would leave a thumbs up. It would help with the YouTube algorithm immensely. If you have questions, leave them in the comment section down below. I always appreciate it. And of course, if you found the video useful, make sure you will share it with anybody who might benefit from it. I'll see you in the next one.